We're live. Everyone, I want to thank you for coming to Adorama, and uh, I want to thank Seth for building this great community space for us to um, gather and learn and um, kind of feed off each other. And uh, there's nothing more important than community, and that's sort of why I'm part of uh, American Photographic Artists. And I want to thank Deb for all she does and putting. Uh, she's a uh, regional director for New York, and boy, does she work hard to put uh, these events together that we can learn off each other and uh, and network and uh, give each other tools to become better photographers and uh, learn about the business. Um, I am here to talk about cinematic portraits, and I guess uh, some of you either love films or you love photography, or you are photographers or you fell in love with the photo, and that's why you're sort of here. So today we're going to dive into talking about cinematography. I think we'll talk about cinematography first, and then go into portraits and then AI, and uh, we'll answer some questions. If we have time at the end, I'm going to talk about maybe jumping into a quick demo of what I do and how I do it. So first off, a little about me. Who is this guy standing in front of you, uh, and why is he talking about this? Um, I am a full-time photographer. Um, I am a, uh, vice executive vice president of uh, American Photographic Artists, um, and uh, a Sony advocate and Adobe content creator. Um, I fell in love with photography. It was not my first job, but we'll go into that uh, in, a, in a little bit. Uh, but we are all here today to talk about cinematic portraiture. And what is cinematic portraiture? How does it differ from regular portraiture? What is uh, the essence of it? Um, for me, uh, it is really about the layering of light, depth, uh, playing with shadows and light, um, and all the techniques you use that. And, and there's a lot of things we kind of associate with uh, cinema and in its format and the way it's laid out, 16.9, and how we uh, really kind of look at a screen. And we've been conditioned ever since we were young and uh, we'll go into that in a minute. But uh, for me, it all kind of starts with lighting. Lighting is pretty much the most important thing we have in photography, no matter what you do. Some people say, oh, I'm an only a natural lighter. You know, um, some people have a flash lighter. I love, I'd light for me as a paintbrush. You use all of it, and if you don't use all of it, you're only using part of your tools. So cinematic portraiture. Um, is often uh, we look at kind of dramatic lighting, directional lighting, a lot to set a mood. Um, uh, if you like, what I love to do is just take moments of cinema and freeze frame them and look at why I love that scene. What is it about that I scene I love? We're going to kind of dive into that much deeper. Next one, I would say composition and framing. This is something we've all learned as a photographer, but when you kind of look at it for doing a cinematic portraiture, suddenly we're playing with a little more wide. 16.9 instead of, you know, that landscape, typical landscape of 4.5 or, or a portrait size. So we're kind of having fun with this extra space. And we have to figure out when we're going to shoot this, especially with generative AI, how we're going to shoot that, how we're going to compose it. And we sort of have to pre-visualize it if we're going to use generative AI. Color grading. As we know, films are made on the mood they look. They can make them look dark, heavy, light. They can look, hi, guys, welcome. Good to see familiar faces here. Um, so it, it really depends on the tones you want to do. And that goes in color grading in the post part of it. Um, and we'll talk about playing with color and choosing color even before you shoot. So the, when you're playing with color pre and post, there's really a lot of control there. And you want to play with that. You know, I love desaturated colors. I think they're very cinematic. I love you know, using smoke to create atmosphere. I love, love light, that layering. Depth of field is something like if you, it's amazing. I was looking at. Uh, I just went, I wanted to go like, oh, who are my favorite cinematographers? Who are my favorite uh, uh, directors? And I want some of my f favorite scenes and movies. And I kept freeze framing, and you kept seeing, whoa, that, that one thing that really got me was seeing a wonderful detailed face. And then everything else was like, went off to softness, this, the bokeh. And uh, I think we can use that a lot in, in what we're about to discuss. Narrative elements. Yes, that's me. Uh, this is all in camera. None of this is uh, actually done. The only thing I have done is extended the sides on this. So yeah, I had to go out there by myself with a smoke machine and light and set it off by myself. And it took me about 30 times to try and get this right. <laughs> because every time I set off the smoke, the, the wind would fire up and the smoke would go this way and trying to hold a lamp and get the flashes right and the triggers and this is I didn't have the right triggers so narrative elements I think are always important in portraiture which also tie into emotional tone so in <clears throat> portraiture obviously there's uh, environmental portraiture in photography I think cinematic is you're trying to really tell a story and it's very important what's in the background how you're saying it how the person's looking a lot of times in cinematic portraiture 
you're probably not looking at the lens, you're probably looking at either another person or, or you know, evoking a mood or something like that. Uh, so emotional tones and telling the story are really important to think about it in, in pre-visualizing. So I realized my style and influence was formed long before I even realized I had any, I don't even know if I have style now, but I think I, I have a style, I have a style where, where I, I, I do shoot. And it took me a long time to realize that. And I think as a young kid, I literally fell in love with cinema. Like, I, I, you know, I, it's, not a, it's not a unique story. I didn't, I loved every social group, but I didn't, was not a part of every social group. I kind of hopped in between here and <clears throat> didn't have a home in terms of like who I hung out with. I wasn't a jock, I wasn't an artist, I wasn't this, I wasn't that. So I went to the movies a lot. I escaped in cinema. I loved cinema. And the more and more I sat there loving it, I really had a type of cinema I liked. And it wasn't war movies, it wasn't westerns, it was, gritty stuff, it was horror films, it was sci-fi, it was fantasy. And I remember looking back at some of the films that really, really kind of, now that I look back in the way I shoot and I'm like looking at my, my stuff, I'm like, oh, that came from when I was a kid. That, like, all of this was formed so long ago that I didn't even realize it until recently. So this is a movie that I saw when I was younger called Delicatessen. Wonderful, wonderful film, and I know some of you know it. And if you look at it, like, a lot of, some of these films you're gonna look at and you're like, well, this is 30 years pre-Wes Anderson. <laughs> the colors, the composition, uh, everything is so well placed and so well, just beautiful. Like this was City of Lost Children, another film that if you watch the colors, everything is so intentional and framed. It's just, it's a work of art. Um, I remember going to this film, Ron, Akira Kurosawa. I saw it, I think in the Ziegfeld, which is a ballroom now, which is so sad. It was one of my favorite theaters in, in the world, beside the Pacific Dome in, uh, in LA, which I don't think is a theater anymore either. But I remember, and it may be just the way I remember it now, but I remember the horses running down black earth with all these red flags and the red blood, and the colors were so incredible, and it made such an impact on me as a, you know, at that time, just a viewer, not knowing that I was ever gonna fall in love with film or become a photographer. Then if you look at this, and like this, doesn't this look like it could be a still from a Wes Anderson film? Amelie, like this is 30 years prior to Wes Anderson shooting his films. Um, and then I just fell in love with the grit of, you know, like David Fincher. Uh, he could, you know, from, from seven to right here, Fight Club. And if you look at, you know, like, pause a moment. You don't have to recreate this, but understand where the lighting is coming from. Understand where the colors are. Understand, like, that we're working in three, three dimensions, but compacting it to two dimensions. So how do we make that really pop in a photo? And it's about layering light. It's about atmosphere. It's about using dark shadows as much as it is light shadows. You know, I mean, come on, that's gorgeous. I don't know why smoke is always incredible in a film. I bought a little smoke, little smoke genie ninja. It's, it's fabulous. If you get, yeah. <laughs> Coconut flavored, that's awesome. Thanks, Seth. <laughs> Hairspray. And I think, <laughs> I think the movie that really set me off that I, I go back and watch over and over and over and over is Blade Runner, which for me uh, was a film that, uh, I think when it came out, it kind of bombed. It was going up against like movies like E.T., I think, at the time and stuff like that. But now, it's, if you look at it, it was all shot in practical effects and sets and stuff like that. And you look at it now, it stands up today as any film, I would say. And the colors and layering and everything that did in that film, for me, like that blew me away. And I think I try and recreate something, that kind of atmosphere, that kind of feel in my photography now. And if you look at these shots, they're just they're gorgeous. I mean, that's, like, that's old Hollywood right there. You look at the lighting, the catch lights in their eyes. This film, this, I don't know, anyone know Blade Runner here? Yeah? Yeah? I, you never, you gotta know your audience, but this scene, Rucker Hauer, the, the whole ending line um, where he says, you know, you know, do you know the last line? Like lost in tears in the rain? That, all those moments we lost in time, like tears in the rain. That wasn't in the film. He took this long monologue, which is probably one of the best death soliloquies in, in cinema, it's just, just beautiful, and he added that, and uh, it became one, a famous, famous scene and uh, very moving, and you can see the, the atmosphere and light, but here's that soft bokeh I'm talking about, of using a lens, and we'll be able to do that with AI and do some really cool stuff. These are the, the latest Blade Runner by Dennis Villeneuve, uh, Denis Villeneuve um, who uh, I think his films are absolutely gorgeous. If you haven't seen uh, Blade Runner 2049 and uh, Dune, they're, they're visually unbelievable, unbelievable, as you can see. This is from uh, Dune right here. 
which they had to post because of the strike, postpone the next one until next year. I was, there was a, I'd be seeing that right now, maybe not here talking to you. <laughs> uh, anyone heard of this word? Yes, girl. Um, are you familiar with it and what it is? Yeah. So this is really the use of light mixed with dark, and uh, and that's that's what I think is the essence of cinematic portraiture, and that's that's what we're going to strive. And I remember when um, I was never supposed to be a photographer. Um, I started out and uh, I worked in restaurants and bars. I went to film school. I worked in film. Never saw my friends and family. Um, just wasn't wasn't happy in the film industry, but I love cinema. And uh, I started opening up bars and restaurants, and uh, just was just so sad. I walked away from it all, and I started picking up a camera. Started shooting stuff all the time. I was uh, asked to shoot things, and uh, suddenly said, yeah, of course I can do that. And spent my time immediately running to the internet, like, how do you like this? How do you do it? And one, one of the great things my stepfather told me to do is, I never took a job that I was qualified for, but I learned how to do it once I got the job and he rushed in to do it. So I kind of like, I'm always learning. I always feel like I'm trying to catch up. I've rebooted myself time, three times. I worked in film and TV. I owned bars and restaurants, and now I'm a photographer. And I say, I kissed a lot of frogs in my life. The camera was my princess. It's my happily ever after. So I feel so lucky every single day that I get to go out and, and do this and share this. But, anyone know who this artist is? Caravaggio? So when I was going to film school, I got lucky right before going into film school to sit down with John Waters at, at dinner. And I'm saying, any advice for a director? I'm like, I thought I'd win an Oscar by 22. Well, I really did. Um, he said, study the masters, study lighting, study painting. And Caravaggio, for me, as soon as I started seeing him, blew me away. And which is funny is Caravaggio's name was actually Michelangelo. But there seemed to be someone else that had that name. <laughs> so <laughs> he's named after the town. Um, and uh, he, he is quite a, quite a, he was quick to anger, and he got, I think he finally died because of a fight. Um, and uh, no one's quite sure how he lit his stuff, but there's a lot of stuff that points to how he did it. And it seems he was doing techniques of photography years before anyone else. Uh, and the reason we kind of know that he was using chemicals, he was friends with people that were in, in, in professors, and he was using techniques to actually kind of burn through a camera obscura onto the wall and use that kind of stuff, which is amazing to me because here's an artist I didn't, I wasn't even interested in photography when I started loving this person. And his use of lighting was amazing. I mean, it's what we copy in cinema to, to this day. What's amazing is uh, the, what we kind of know what he did because he got in a lot of trouble because he got police writers and stuff like that. He would rent places to, uh, to uh, paint his, uh, his models and stuff like that, which were usually prostitutes and vagabonds and they didn't like that. But he would knock holes in the ceiling so the light would come down and he could light us up. He, total dark room and he would light through that way, which is pretty amazing. And if you see his work, uh, it's pretty amazing. He was an orphan by tw uh, the age of 11, so he kind of, uh, for him to do what he was doing and rise above always uh, amazes me. And you can see his use of light here is, is, is when you see what I shoot, I, once again, influenced way before I realized I was being influenced. Now, once we look at this, it's important to look at color palettes. And we're looking at, you know, we're really trying to make cinematic portraiture. So really kind of playing off the colors. As I said before, colors are so important in cinema. It can make something happy, sad, uh, an evolution of change. There's just amazing things you can do with color palettes. So I can sit there and I try and look at scenes. If I see a scene, I love that scene. You can look up pretty much and go, oh, Stanley Kubrick, uh, let's go, uh, The Shining. And you can find a color palette online, usually, to kind of show you that these wonderful moments. And I think early on, I don't know if people know uh, Luc Besson, I think early on, uh, La Femme Nikita, another film. I, have the, I, have, I love these dark, moody cinema kind of things. I, for me, it's like The Professional, oh, amazing. Modern age is Joker. I don't, if anyone's seen the Joker, I think that's a piece of cinema brilliance. I, I truly do. I know some people uh, agree and some people think it's too long, but for me, it's, uh, it's an ode to film in a way that uh, hasn't been done in a long time. Absolutely gorgeous. And I think really, Scott, when I was younger, I knew more about cinematographers than I ever did photographers. I didn't even know what a photographer was. Cinematographer, I'm like, oh, I love that one. <laughs> So for me, it, it's all started there. And you can see, everything is this use of light, dark shadow, smoke, atmosphere, foreground, background. Um, it's just, it's incredible. So that sort of brings up to now, sort of why we're here, to kind of start talking about 
generative AI. I know this is a hot topic for a lot of people because generally I think, oh, it's stealing our jobs, it's doing that and the other. It's here and it will steal some jobs and it will do that. But like a tool, like anything else, it is important to use and important to know how to use. And I think for me, I, I think we're at a time right now that is so exciting. It's like a renaissance of technology and creativity in a way that hasn't been around in a long time that I can walk around with a bag this size, have a DJI Pocket 3 gimbal that shoots 4K, a drone in here, lights in here, cameras in here, in a bag this size. That would have taken something, you know, if you were on a movie production, thousands and millions of dollars to do, helicopters and, and dollies and, and just like, so right now, like, I throw a laptop in here, I can even edit it. We're, so we have such a creative stage right now, and I think, what we're, it's getting so good that we don't even realize that it, we're, we're viewing it every single day. So like, I don't, for you, like I don't, Last of Us on HBO, yes, I, it is a video game turned into a, a show, but it's brilliantly done. And it is so brilliantly done when you're watching even regular moments, you don't even realize that they've used so much to recreate abandoned places, textures, all kinds of stuff. And this is a little before and after. And you can see some of the blue screens so I want to think of what we're doing with generative AI is not like mid-journey where we're going to go in and create a full thing from a text prompt. We are fully intentionally going to use a camera. And what I love to do is shoot in portrait. And I want to take that like 51-2, get close, use the full sensor on my subject. Ah, I'm in tight on you. But I know that in post I'm going to extend it out. It's going to become like an anamorphic, anamorphic lens, and then we're going to create magic. And that's sort of something that doesn't really exist. I mean, if you were going to do that, it just wouldn't really work. Now, now we can do it in ways that really trick the mind's eye, and, and it's, it's wonderful. And here's another example of you know, before and after. And it's just incredible. And we can do this with AI. So you're taking the practical thing of a very intentional shoot. But I know, just like cinema, my, G, my, my AI is going to be my green screen. It's going to be my matte painting. That's what I'm going to use to extend my vision. And what's great now is like if I was shooting in this room and I saw William who's sitting in the front row here. I love him in those seats. I don't like this scaffolding. I don't like the camera right there. I know I can shoot here. And with generative AI, I can make that disappear. I'm no longer limited by just, I have to get rid of that. I have to f flag it. I can't, I have to move my thing. I can, I can complete my vision because that's what I want. It's lit perfectly. I want that. That is not important to me anymore, which is pretty cool. So the role of general AI in portraiture. So this is where, when it was first, I got to play with Adobe and uh, the generative expand early on. And I'm like, all right, let me play with some of my old portraits and figure out what I can do here. So this is an example of a before and after. So right away here you see, that's the before picture. And you can see what I can do there by expanding it. Now in the original picture, there were no blinds. But there were blinds on the floor, so I had to figure that out. And then when I was trying to you know, make you know, these blinds with AI, I had to go back in, and there was no crimple in the blind, so I had to kind of create that. So it's not perfect yet. But if you know how to play it and place it, you can create little places and, and tweak it and use your clone stamp and really kind of use it. And if you see here what an amazing job it does, I'm missing a lot of that camper. It brought it back. It didn't do it perfect on this side right here on the end, but I was able to, to get enough in there with a clone stamp and recreate it and do it, you know, get and stuff that. But it perfectly did the front of it, and boy, the, the fall off and stuff like that is wonderful. So you're really getting into kind of like, all right, with purpose, I'm going to shoot this, but I know I'm going to ex extend it. And if I wanted to, I could put something else there in generative AI if I wanted to, but I'm not looking to like recreate a whole scene. I'm just trying to enhance what I'm in my mind I'm already doing. And you see this? This is a very simple expand. In a field, I'm shooting her, and there were some people off to the right that just wouldn't move. You know, so I couldn't get the wide shot that I wanted. But in this, how simple it was, just, just to pull it out just a little bit. So for me, it's magic. And I don't know how many, I see some people with the Sony hats here. So you were at Sony Creative, uh, and they built an incredible set for me. And I talked about Blade Runner and how much I love Brenner. They built a Blade Runner set. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I'm going to do an example right there and kind of show uh, exactly what I have there um, for, uh, you know, this intensive purpose. And I think in a moment we'll have time that I can go in and actually show you how I did this. Um, any questions at, at this point? For What do we got? 
how do you match the direction of light between what was shot and what the AI generates? Are there specific prompts? Yeah. Um, so when you go into uh, Adobe Photoshop, and I'll show this, um, there, there you'll you hit the crop tool, and you're just basically pulling it out. And uh, right now, it, it, there isn't as much resolution if you're pulling out certain sections. So if you know you're going to blow this up to a huge thing, you, there's, I'm not going to get into it today because it's very scientific. You can't, well, not that scientific, but you have to do it in blocks so it's full resolution. But I will do in sections and stuff like that. So if I have a picture here, I know I'm going to blow out this way and this way. I may pull it out this way first and see where it goes. Um, AI is really good at automatically sensing where the light's coming from. So you really don't have to play with that. As soon as you pull it out and create it, it's going to give you three options of what it thinks. And those three options may work and they may not work. They may you may use part of it and then uh, create another part and uh, go over it and fix the parts that aren't aren't right. So you, it is a it is a you know what's great about this is this is the worst it will ever be. It's only getting better every day and it's getting better by leaps and bounds that it's kind of scary. When I first started uh, beta testing uh, a lot of the uh, these AIs, I'm like oh that's good messing up the hands is not good here. Next month I'm like oh wow next two months oh my god it's I, it's so rapidly increasing that it's kind of frightening and it's getting so good and it's becoming a tool that uh, I, I for me I love it I mean I, I feel like now I can finally complete visions that I wasn't able to do before uh, some of the gear I use here uh, it, you know and this is the great thing it's like you don't need a lot to create a lot so I mean uh, I don't need to run into a studio and have tons of light but when I want to do that, I can. But sometimes I just go out with a little AD, you know, Flashpoint AD100, you know, with an angler pop-up, or I'll go out with, I, I love my new Stella lights because they're both uh, strobe and constant light. And I can set that, they're literally this big. They're tiny and very powerful. So I'll take those out and, and use those. Uh, I'm a big Sony shooter, as, as everybody kind of knows. I don't think that's a surprise. Um, uh, the Smoke Ninja for atmosphere, I, I love using and stuff like that. Software, I am, I'm diehard. I don't exist as a photographer, me personally. I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there, but me personally, I don't exist without Adobe and Sony. Uh, Sony gave me the tools when I had no confidence in what I was doing to look through an EVF and not have to go, oh, one sec, oh, one sec, oh, one sec, and chimp all the time. So for me, it was a huge thing that allowed me to become the artist. And they keep growing and growing and growing. Now they have, you know, global shutters and can do stuff with lights and, and strobes that's really kind of incredible. Um, so I think I'm going to uh, jump into an example here and show you how I do what I do. So I'm going to bring this down, show you my messy. Uh... You oh, yeah, sure. Shoot uh, questions. I love questions. You can see in the chat, I've heard some people say that they worry that they use too much AI. They lose the copyright to the image myth or fact. All right. So we are in really, really early days of litigation. Nothing has really gone to the Supreme Court yet. Nothing. So every, we're in the wild, wild west of this. Um, so if uh, you're using uh, Adobe has licensed a lot of their stuff, uh, I think all of it. Um, in fact, they licensed a bunch of my uh, catalog to put into their Adobe stock, which is all good. I don't know about the ones that's pulling off internets or something like that. Um, if it's clearly a watermark in there and you can see it and like it was used in or, or someone's work, yeah, you might run into a problem. But what we're doing here is we're creating stuff out of our own photos and expanding. I'm not really creating a, a, a photo from scratch. I'm actually expanding what's in my photo. So it's not really, it's not, it's not a photo that someone else is. So I, I'm not worried about that at this point on that. And it hasn't gone legal. So there's no real definitive answer on that yet. There will be at some point. Uh, it, someone's going to take it. and. Uh, I'm sure there's cases in the courts now on some of this. So let me boot up Lightroom. I, I, when I do my cinematic portraiture, I, I really bounce back between um, Lightroom and uh, Photoshop. Uh, I'm not one of those people that's going to be here and tell you I bring this to this percentage or that percentage. I love breaking things and pulling sliders and seeing how far I can break a, an image and where it's going to go too grainy. And I love playing with stuff. I'm, I'm like, let's just get in there and mess things up. I don't want to be like, well, this one goes to 95% this. And I'm like, that's not me. I'm not going to give you the breakdowns like technicals. Um, so let's see. Do we have to switch over to? Why are you? Wait, what? <laughs> Try and plug in a point of because it yeah. might just be reading your play out. So I'm going to have to do that twice here. So let's see what we got. Uh, see, this is, this is why I waited until the end to switch over. Because are you, I, are you running extended display? 
Um, I don't think so. It worked. It worked perfectly. Let me shut down uh, that. So let's see. We'll shut this down. PowerPoint. Are there other questions while we're doing this? Uh -huh, of course, of course. All right. All right, that's shut down. Let's bring this up. See if that, there we go. All right, so this is the first thing we're going to look at, and we're going to take this and bring it into Photoshop. So right, right now I'm in Lightroom. So the first things I'm going to look at when I'm creating, um, that I know I'm going to expand this, is over here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, all, but uh, we'll show here. On the... On this side of it, the, there's, there's a little light. I'm going to go right back here and show you this. This part, AI is going to take that and do something with it. So automatically, I'm going to get rid of this. The top part where the ceiling is, Jeez. that's... Use your cursor for all mine. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so we're over here. There you go. Hey, guys, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just showed people the most amazing thing. You didn't get to yeah. see it at home? I'm so sorry. <laughs> So up here at the very top of the image, you can see my cursor right here. Uh, it, this ceiling part, I'm going to get rid of that before I give it to AI. And I can use AI and the AI remove tool to get rid of that. But there's parts of this picture that I'm going to get rid of before I even bring it to AI. So right away, I kind of want to like look at this picture. And like I said, I want to break it. I want to see where it goes. So if I bring it up, we can see where it breaks. If I bring it down to the darkness. So basically, what I kind of do with every picture is I know that I love to desaturate it. I just want to crush the bracks a little. So I'm going to put two dots on my line here and then pull up the blacks a little, which desaturated immediately. I'm crushing those blacks. And then I love to give it a little more texture. So I'm going to give it a little clarity, which is right there. You can see not too much. Oh, you see, there's where it's, uh, it's, it's playing with my, let's see. There we go. There it is. All right, so we bring up my clarity a little bit, and that, that's pretty good enough to bring into uh, Photoshop. And then that's where we're going to do the uh, uh, magic before we bring it back in. So we're going to let this boot up, and hopefully, we, yep, it's on the screen, perfect. And we're going to bring this file right into Photoshop, and this is where we're going to do the magic of what we're doing. And you're going to see how easy it is. And what's the fun in this is you're going to just bring old photos in, you're going to shoot no, new photos, and you're going to kind of when you're out there and kind of composing things, you can compose to do this. So as soon as this comes up, we'll be able to show this to you. Boom, 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 boom. See, if I was at the store right now, I'd say, oh, look at this. The computer's not fast. I'm in a beautiful adorama. Maybe I need a new computer. But, oh, here we go. Okay, fantastic. No hard so, selling. <laughs> so right here, you see, I have this wonderful remove tool. So right here, I can just bring it right down on that line that I was talking about I don't like. And then this rooftop right here, I don't like. There's a little white on this side I don't like. And this big patch, I, that's, that's bothering me too. So now you see it, it's all lit up there, and I'll, I'll let AI Remove do its thing. And it shouldn't take long, hopefully. But we're alive, so it might. Um, but that's the, yeah. See, I need a faster computer. I hear uh, Mac has some M3s out there that are kind of fun. <laughs> fun. <laughs> I do like tech, I won't lie. I do like tech. Yeah. Uh, Mike Rubio is asking, your focus today is on Adobe Generative AI, which riffs off the photo itself, correct? As opposed to, say, removing a subject from the photo and placing it on a background entirely created by AI. So, I mean, there's obviously, you know, just like anything else, like when I first started using Photoshop, um, I'm like, oh, I learned how to do it this way. And then show me how to do it a different way, a different way. There's 17 different ways to do the same thing. Uh, what I, I'm not trying to do a composite here. I'm just trying to, I, I like keeping things nice and easy. And if they're fun, I know I'm going to create more. And I found this just so easy in complementing what I want to do and getting to the end result that this is the way I do things. There's tons of ways out there to do it. It's still a little bright here, so I'm just going to bring that in there. I don't know if that answered his question at all. <laughs> But hopefully, now, I mean, they, uh, do you think that answered it? I don't even know. You acknowledge them. That's all they want. They just want attention. <laughs> They're not really asking. All right. Them. So cool. So right here, we're going to go to the the uh, the expand, and I'm just going to pull it out. And you remember, we're we're kind of going for that 16:9 look. So I know right there we can play rule of thirds. Maybe I want to keep her there or something like that. Let's play with this first half first. And right now, suddenly I get this pop up down at the bottom. If if I move it here. I could actually type in something there, keep it dark and moody, but I'm going to just see what it does automatically off the bat. So I'll hit done, and then we're going to hit generate. Let's see what I'm doing. 
Please connect to the internet to use this feature. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. The one thing we didn't check pre. pre. All right, so let's bring this up. Come on, be a host, Riff. Hey, guys. So uh, any questions on this so far, right? Uh, so what, what we did with the other day is I know there are a couple people that are on my walk, and, uh, and I told them it, it, right off the bat, we're going to shoot this in a portrait. We're going to be nice and tight so we can bring it into and do exactly what we're about to do here. So hopefully now we can uh, go back, and I'll start from the start again. Boom, boom. All right, so let's go back. All right, so I'm going to pull it out again and just show you what I did here. So let's bring it out. There we go. So done. Of course, it's not playing well with us. You know, that's why I hate live demos. That's why I, 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 I tried to keep it all in the in in the in the uh, <laughs> the PowerPoint. <laughs> When this works, it's amazing. <laughs> it's so intelligent, it doesn't want to work with you. Uh, it, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's being fun right here. Generative expand, come on, play with me. Yeah, hit it one more time, it should go. This feature is drag the can. All right, we're going to reload it one more time. I think that's now that we're on the internet. Questions, anyone? Fun, fun, fun. The tech tech uh, not working with us, right? As it's saving this ridiculous thing that we don't need to save. What's up? Yeah, go ahead. Do you ever feel that AI does not create exactly the look that you're looking for? Absolutely. Okay, so um, the, the question was, uh, do I ever think that AI isn't going where I want it to go? And uh, do I want to reshoot or shoot? So right now, yeah, I think it's a tool that we're playing with, and it's not always going to be there. But I am actually more often than not really surprised at what it is doing. Um, uh, it's... Uh, it's kind of magical. I mean, it, there's like little elves in there doing stuff. Like, I don't know how it works. Um, it's, it's kind of scary. It's... Uh, it's, it, it's so good that uh, I can't imagine in one year what it's going to be because it is so far advanced at this point that it's only going to get better and better and better. Um, I find that I am more creative now that I will go back and use photos that I thought were eh. And by just expanding them and playing with new stuff that I'm now like, wow, I, I love this image. There's new stuff. I feel like I'm getting to play with all this stuff that uh, didn't really exist before. And, uh, it really is making me so excited. So let's go to try and open this up in Photoshop one more time and see if we can get this running. I had a, I had a total feeling this was going to happen. You got a question? Yeah. Uh, dead pixel necromancer in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. What I do you think it. are good commercial applications for this tool? Oh, I mean, the, the, the commercial applications of this. I mean, like I'm using it more fine art right now. Um, I, the the it's getting so good at product photography. It's getting so good at uh, lighting. It's getting so good at uh, it, it will get to a point where we can post light things in ways that we can literally pull the light. I want it to come from this side to that side. We'll literally be able to do all of that um, so quickly. The the I think the the true we haven't even realized how far and great it's going to going to get. Um, so we're going to hit generate here, and hopefully this time it does it. And I think it is. So here we go. So now it's generating. So we're going to see on this left side it's generating this this portion. And then I'm going to go to the right side. And then you know as uh, you know how we get those wonderful black bars on the top and bottom. You know why those were there? Because TVs were square. So when they actually went back to letterbox size, they had to put these black bars. So whenever I'm doing a generative portrait, I love actually putting in the black bars because for me it just it it goes there. So right there you can see it, it's pulled it off right there, and I can, if I pull it this way, this way, then suddenly I can generate again. 
and we're going to look at, and before I go into show you like all the different stuff that I kind of do with um, the picture once I've created it, it's going to create a full thing. I'll bring it down. A lot of times I'll bring it back into Lightroom and crush my colors a little more, bring out the definitions, because now that I have two sides, I want to equal it out. So now that we're kind of playing here, we'll get this wonderful second side in. And right off the bat, I, 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 th I think you'll be amazed at what it pulls off. And that's kind of crazy. I don't love this person over here, but you can get rid of this stuff very quickly uh, by playing with, you know. So right here you can see it gives me three options. So I have this, oh, there's a good option. I like the second one. And then the third one, let's see what it does with that. Don't like it. So I love this second one. So I'm going to keep the second one in there. And if we go look at the first one, that's really bright on the left side. I think it's too bright. So let's see what the second one was. All right, that's getting there. Let's look at the third option. No, that doesn't work at all. So you see, a lot of times, it's going to create something that doesn't work at all. So I can actually go into this, and I choose my second one. All right, that's all right. It's not great. But if I wanted to, I can bring a marquee in here and just highlight the area I want it to replace and generate again. And if I really want to get creative and I was working on a project, I'd start putting in keywords like, uh, I want a neon sign. You know, let's do that. Uh, well, let's do a neon sign. Just keep it simple. And we'll generate that. So now it's actually going to put a neon sign in that area. So we can go back and refine and refine and refine until we like this. You'll find you want to look at areas that uh, where, the, where it's merging across. And, you know, this wet part down here, I'm going to merge that. I can even use a clone stamp tool and get something in there. But watch when it puts the neon in here. So. For me, this is a lot of fun. I mean, I love creating something like this. And you'll find you're, you're probably going to spend a lot of hours doing this stuff. Oh, that's just <laughs> terrible. And Generated a new language. Look at that. It's, it's, nice. it's just look, yeah, it's just like, hey, boobs here. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Let's. <laughs> that one's just god awful. Um, <laughs> You know, sometimes they work great. Sometimes they, it just makes you, you know, f funny, crazy stuff. Um, if I go back, let's see if I go here. I'm going to show you, like, at home. Let's see, is this it? Bring this one up here. So that's what I ended up with when I was playing with at home. So you can see you can get to a really cool spot. And, and, it, and if you look at the top and the bottom, I've created black bars and, uh, you know, kind of finish it off. And, and we're in Lightroom here, so I'm going to show you some of the stuff that I did here. There, there. If you look at the the right side here, over on the side here, I didn't like that. I don't want things drawing the attention to the sides and stuff like that. So basically, I pulled that out through Generative and played with that, and we we end up something, you know, like that. It was terrible. There was too many people in the background, so we go back to here. So when you're finally kind of finishing off this file, I like to go in here and kind of play with bringing a little clarity. I want it to look very movie-like, so I'm going to crush my blacks once again a little more. And if you see that, I'm just using those at anchor points so it doesn't pull my blacks all over the place. Of course, it did right there. There we go. So if you, it's just harder to work on laptop. So now you see the softer, softer blacks. That really kind of gives you that cinematic look. I want people looking at the people in the middle. So we're going to go here. I love to sharpen post right here. So here's a little tip. You pull your sharpen and if you hold down in here, if I pull it here, just the white is getting sharpened. So it's not sharpening the whole image. It's just sharpening those parts. So you're actually in Lightroom uh, Classic, you can actually pull off this sharp mask, which really kind of great. The tools that they're doing in, in here, from the masking and the select subject, like if I just wanted to select them and work on them, it, the Lightroom's just getting crazy fun to work with. Uh, and it's why, for me, um, I, I don't want to go in and do tons of layers in Photoshop. I don't want to do it like here. It's making my life so easy. Like, I'm going to show you one little trick here that for Lightroom, it's, this is worth the price just for me. So I'm going to uh, create a mask that's just selecting the subject right now. So right now, it's looking for the subjects and it's going to find them. And then you'll see just here, oh, look at that. It has her. So what I love to do is I can take this, intersect this mask with a linear gradient. So suddenly I can direct the light. So what I'm going to do here is kind of drag across here. I just want that part. 
and maybe I want to expose that a little lighter so suddenly she's brighter there. So I can control the light from either side by doing a mask there. And that's one of my favorite tools. And anytime you uh, add you know, a, a thing, you're, it's going to change your color. So you're going to have to rebalance it just a little bit. You know, I'll bring it back down, make it a little more blue, add a little black to it. And uh, there we go. So also, I know that I want to really kind of bring people back into the other thing I do on post just to show you to finish an image is I add grain. Grain will actually reintroducing grain back on a clean image will make it look sharper, um, which is great. And then I want to pull in just a little vignette so they kind of stand out there. And now we're suddenly now we're looking at a much more cinematic image, right? When we're going from you know just that one little slip to something like this, like it's a lot of fun. And what's great is I have shot on locations and fashion shots where there was this great green tile, but then there was a kitchen. And then it's like, I, I wanted that tile extended. I wanted it beautiful. I wanted this model in silver dress up against this green tile. And I could bring it into AI, and suddenly <coughs> I'm extending that tile down. And it's like, uh, it, I've created a place that sort of exists, but not like I envisioned it. I wanted that green tile to go all the way. So, you know, in using AI in that respect, you're not actually like, uh, I think someone asked like the commercial aspects of it is for me to create a location that is sort of there but not really there and I'm not stealing it from someone it's just I've now created a, an image that I wanted that wasn't really there so that for me is like the most important thing is to be able to finish off that kind of stuff and to run out and shoot in locations that I can't usually shoot at or that have limitations and that the, it's really kind of endless the possibilities of playing with this and to be able to pull out that sides and it's getting so good at it especially if you're shooting in places that have patterns like uh, we were at uh, Central Park the other day shooting this and there was this wonderful stone wall and I, I shot the model right here and I expanded out it I could have this wall going on for miles and it's just like, ah, oh, the potential of that. Of making stuff that, in my head, of when I grew up like watching you know, fantasy movies of legend or you know, never-ending stories, like, I can do stuff that only created in my head. And I'm not a composite person. I don't want to sit there creating layers and layers and layers. Like, this lets me be such a free storyteller and enjoy, enjoy what I'm doing. And if you don't enjoy it, if it, it feels like a burden, it's hard to do. But for me, it's like I get to go in there and really twist things up and play. And, and you'll find yourself, I may do 16 versions of this. I don't know which one I'm going to love. And I tell you, the one thing that gets me is like when people go, oh, should I do this in black, white, or color in general? But now I'm like, which AI one do you like? This one, this one, or this one? And that's the most exciting thing. Um, I know we have a lot of different shooters here. It's like uh, I'm interested in what you guys think of this. And how you would use it. I mean, is this something you would use? Yeah, what type of portraiture do you, do you shoot portraits? Uh, environmental, editorial. Uh, so I'm by sports. sports, yeah. So I, I don't know how you'd use this in sports, but it might be something really cool. Uh, you know, especially if you're doing uh, portrait shots of sports players, you could do something really cool. Especially, I, I'm seeing like, you know, the incredible stadium lighting and extending stadiums and, and doing some crazy stuff like that. Um, William, you do a lot of stuff where you're, you actually do some compositing, I've seen in your photos. Uh, and I know you use a lot of patterns and windows and stuff like that. Wouldn't it be cool to pull those out and do stuff and, and see what it does with those? Because Yeah, I, I agree. The expansion of this and, and the being able to create certain things and get rid of things. Like, you know, it's like how many times we've been on a, on a street corner and there's a, a, a trash can and it's, oh, it just looks terrible. I just want that out of the, the image is perfect, but I want to get rid of that trash can. You know, it's like what C. McCurry pulls stuff out all the time, doesn't it? I mean, you pull out stuff, don't you? No? You're just a journalist at heart? I, I, um, we don't got time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, uh, let's see, um, any, any questions on, on some of the stuff I'm doing? Yeah. I have one more about, like, in terms of, like, background generation. Mm -hmm. I, took, I took these portraits a couple of months ago, and they were, like, just on a plain background. And I know you can expand out, like, continuously, like, or, like, change the color slightly, but I don't know how to, like, generate something new out of that without it breaking, like, the side. So, doing that thing, like you said, like, 
So you're, you're taking someone on a white background yeah. and wanting to add a different background entirely? Not, like, more like extend it to like add like a little bit. Like. So say you shot on, uh, say, a, a seamless, and you're, you get the sides of the seamless, you want to extend the seamless and add like, you know, a little more color and depth to it. I mean, there's lots of ways to do that. So with uh, what's great is if, you know, if you're shooting on a short seamless now and you want to extend that seamless, it's making it really easy to not have to go buy an eight-foot seamless, you know, and, and you can shoot on a five-by-seven seamless or something like that, uh, which is great. Um, but uh, with that, you can also, what I tend to do is, you know, I, I think you want to play with your edges and stuff like that. And when you're on something like that, that's where you play with your texture. You play with what's great about Lightroom is you can actually take a subject mask them and then invert it and work only on the background. So suddenly then I can vignette the background, I can add a little texture, take the texture away. With Lightroom now they have the wonderful defocus, you know, so I can add bokeh to it and make it you know, sharper or less sharp. I mean, what's kind of crazy now is the ability to shoot something and in post be able to do things that we weren't able to before, like add lighting from the left to the right, to add focus in or out. And it's getting better and better and better. So you know, one of these days I'm not gonna have to buy this. I just bought a 135 millimeter, 1.8 Sony lens. And like, oh, I love the way that looks, but you know, it's like on an iPhone now, which is crazy, you can go in and now change the, your, your Fs. You know, I can make it F1.2 to 8, 8 point, it's just crazy. So I think we are living in a day here I want people to take advantage of the iPhone in their pocket because every day you should be going out and shooting three things. I go out and shoot a, a portrait, go out and shoot a still, go out and shoot a landscape. And it's going to be, it's freeing to grab your cell phone and go out and do that. Because you're going to take those ideas back and you're going to have a lot of fun when you're out there with just this camera you can do. I mean, just how fun is it that you can kind of just turn it upside down, get low, you can shoot things. It's freeing. As a, as a creator, we want to have fun. And so get out there and, and play with the, you know, a, a small phone and like that and every day and use those ideas when you come back. So when you come back and you're going to go, all right, I had an idea. I saw a great location. I took some shots of it. I'm going to come back with my real camera, with a model. I know how I'm going to light it. I'm going to do this stuff. Like you're always pushing yourself to create, which, the, you know, it's like we get to do a lot of things in the world. But if we love what we do, and I hate that comment, oh, if you, you, if you find a job you, you love doing, you never work a day of your life, that's just not true. You work twice as hard, but you enjoy it. And that's, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do uh, is enjoy what we do. And AI, for me, has allowed me to really fall back into love with what I'm doing and open up a creative atmosphere and a creative you know, venue, a vein, like this river that is now flowing that I can do things that I never thought I could do before and have fun with it. And it's just making me push the boundaries every day. And I'm still discovering, as everyone. So I think as we learn with this, is the first step is to, all right, I love that film. I love that color. I love that uh, kind of mood. Go out there with that intention and start shooting. So you know when you come back, you're looking at AI as a tool to finish that vision. It may not all be there yet, and you may have to play and do different things, but right now, I think it's gonna make you like, get out and do it, and that's the most important thing. Do we have any other questions from online or anything like that? Uh, no, just our own film, Fernando, who is the senior producer here at Adorama, oh, uses wow. it for our YouTube thumbnails all the time, uh, which is true because we have to make them so fast and such volume that it saves us a lot of man hours. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, it's... Um, I, I've never been more excited to be a photographer right now than, you know, it's like, I know I'm getting better as a photographer and, you know, I, I feel like I came late to the game and I'm always trying to catch up with the kids that are on TikTok, the people that are you know, doing this and, the, and, you know, there are people that are out there just have natural technical skill and, and go out there and now... I can kind of forget, you know what, the best way is when you first start out as a photographer, you have these two circles running. And the one is the creative. And when you first start, that creative is going crazy. You're loving it. You're, just, you're shooting things you don't know why you're shooting. It. It's like, I just got to get that picture. I get this. And then someone tells you, oh, well, if you, uh, the technical side, if you put it to 1.8 and, you, and or you, you slow your shutter speed, you can get motion. And then suddenly you're, you're all confused by getting things technically right in your camera. And then your, your creative side is just out the window. It's gone. It's like it, you can't, you're like, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. <laughs> it's like you're crazy. And then suddenly if you really spend the time learning your craft, and it's three things, ISO, shutter speed, aperture. If you learn that triangle, you've mastered your camera. 
And the best thing you can do is just play with light every day. The one thing I did was I bought, it creeps me out still, I bought a, uh, <laughs> I bought an, a mannequin on Amazon. And for the first three months I scared myself every time I walked into the room. But I sat there every day playing with lights, whether it was string lights, whether it was a light bulb, whether it was LEDs, whether it was a flash, play with light. The more you play with light, the more you master your craft. Everything we do is about darks and shadows. And if you understand how to use the shadows and control the light, oh, you're going to make some incredible dynamic and cinematic photos. And that's, that's what we need to do is, like, forget the AI at first. It is going to only enhance what you do, but go out and play with the darks and shadows. Play with that light. Paint with light. That holds true with using lightning. You just, you just described lightning. Yeah. The use of Lightroom in addition. Yeah. So the, the use of Lightroom, it's funny because, you know, it's like, oh, people, people are like, oh, well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm against, you know, creating things in Lightroom. I'm creating something. It's not, it's not the purest photography thing. It's like, I went to a fantastic exhibit in a museum, and it was like Lightroom and Photoshop, pre-Lightroom Photoshop. And the amount of things they did and created in the camera, and they did, we've always had a, a fascination of creating. And I'm not just a photographer. I'm an image maker. If I was a journalist, fine. I'm not supposed to change things. That's a code of ethics. You shouldn't do that. But I am here to create what I want to convey, the way I see the world. And we all see it completely different. And the most beautiful thing about what we do is you can stand in front of an apple, I can stand in front of an apple, and we'll shoot it in two different ways and see it in two different ways and want to tell two different stories. But the important thing is when you see that apple, what do you want to say about it? It's your voice. Everything that we do in photography is about the way we see it, the way we feel it. We're, if you're a true artist, then you feel in a different way. You're, we're, it's hard to share. We're putting our souls and love and what we do on the line, and there's a love for it. So to, I, I feel like I, I, I came from, you know, everybody know uh, the Christmas uh, reindeer one with the Isle of Misfit toys? I, I, I live on the Isle of Misfit toys. And my photo community and everybody around me are my friends that I now have this community of people that see and play. I go to space camp with people every day. I get to play in, in Comic-Con with people that feel the same way and love, fell in love with photos, fell in love with telling a story. Don't just take a picture. It's all about you and what you want to say, how you want to capture that person, how you want to capture that moment. What do you want to say about it? What kind of gravity do you want it? Light, light happy, funny, sad. All of this emotion, feel it. And if you're not feeling it, push yourself to get there. I think when I went back to photo school, the hardest thing they made me do one day was, are oh, you going to go out and shoot 10 people on the street? I went, no, 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 I'm not doing that. Why not? I, I, I don't go, I'm not welcome to strangers. I, I fought it. I fought it tooth and nail. But they made me do it. And you know what? It was probably one of the best things I've ever done in my life. Because now I can walk up to people and talk to people and the camera is a key that's opened up doors that I, were locked to me, opened up travel. It's opened up things to me that I, I just, it, weren't, it wasn't part of my world. And now I get to go around doing what I love. I'll close, I think we're almost at the time, right? But I'll close with a story, or, unless there are other questions. I went to, um, I always, growing up, I, you know, I, I was off in the corner. Now I can talk to people and I found a voice and I, because I love telling stories and showing people. And even when I was a young kid, I always had a camera. And it was to document and share. I loved sharing. I had the hardest time when I went to school when they said, build a series and why do you take a picture? Well, I take a picture because I saw something I liked. Now I take it because I want to build a story. I want to tell you something. I want to create an atmosphere. I want to now. Everything I've learned up until this point is culminated to uh, my love of movies, creating something that's very cinematic, telling a story, really kind of doing things that inspire me. I went to a party at uh, Photo Gravisca at the, their fancy little mini limelight chapel. I walked in there, a friend of mine had uh, released a liquor. I walked in, my first thing was run. I, I don't know anyone here, I, fly, I, I don't want to stand in the corner by myself. I had my camera with me, brought the camera out, started taking pictures. End of the night, I have tons of new friends. I am showing images, everybody's calling me over, we're having a blast. I'm showing people like the pictures I took, and they're like, oh my God, you're coming in. 
it opened a door and allowed me to be who I wanted and broke down barriers. Um, I, I, I can't say enough that I feel so lucky to do what I do. And that uh, one of the reasons I joined APA and became you know, one of, on the national board in, in, in New York was because to find something that made me so happy and to be able to give that out back and help others achieve something that made me so happy, I, I have to do it. And my, someone asked me a question is, what's your greatest advice to a photographer? Just starting out. And I said, um, if you don't wake up every day and whether it's a good day, bad day, inexplicably you don't know how to explain it and put it into words that you have to do this and you can't wait to get back to do it, go find what does make you feel that happy. Because that's what this is about. And it's going to be hard days. It's going to be good days. I can't tell you how many times I wanted to walk away from this. Like, I just don't feel good enough. There's, a, there's true imposter syndrome um, where I, I walk into rooms and I'm like, I don't, I don't belong here. <laughs> I shouldn't be speaking to people. I am so honored that you came here to listen to me, to hear what I had to say. Um, and hopefully if there's a little nugget you came from it, that's fantastic. But I think if you walk away with anything, walk away with trust your voice and go out and create. And if you stop yourself and you don't get closer and you don't cross those barriers and push yourself, you're not do you're doing yourself any service. You really have to. And it, and it comes through. And the greatest thing is if you show the love for it, everyone else will get that. It's infectious. They'll get it. You walk up to someone on the street corner and with the love and showing them what you do, the worst they're going to say is, no, thank you. That's okay. So if there's no questions, I want to thank you all for coming. But uh, we'll take any questions that you might have on anything. <laughs> In the back. So Lightroom is, is camera raw. I mean, it's, it's a raw process editor. So there's no point in me going from, from one to the other. I, I love cataloging, and, um, and uh, camera raw is fantastic. It's just it's, it's the same things are built in. It's all built on the same engine. Uh, for me, I, I, it's just my workflow. I love instantly throwing in, seeing my grid of photos in, in, in uh, Lightroom, being able to interact with that, instantly bring it up, do all my quick touch-ups, mask, do this little stuff. If there's more complicated stuff, I'll just throw it into uh, Photoshop. Do you know? I may have to add a layer or get rid of something. Or there's some more advanced tools that I'll use in, um, especially in retouching. Retouching is still uh, pretty much solo on uh, on Photoshop for me. But uh, I, I enjoy working in Lightroom. I, I just find it it's easy to use. I love what it does. Some people get frustrated. I, I've never had that frustration. I, I truly, for me, it's like. I use other programs, and I'm probably feeling what some people feel about other things. I'm like, I get in there, I'm like, ah, I'm happy. It's my happy place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, the, the question was basically is we're getting to a point where you know, reality and non-reality is indistinguishable. And that, that obviously that's a, a fear everyone has. And Adobe has that fear too. And, and one of the last things Adobe did do was introduce uh, a, a signature into the, into the photo to really market that it, this was touched or this was, you know, there was an AI in it. You know, so there, there's, uh, we, we need to figure that out. And that's as a global society when we're, you know, video is getting so good, I can make myself, I can just record like, a couple sentences of my voice, record my face, and suddenly I don't have to create, you know, TikToks. I can have my avatar do it. That exists now, um, and it's only getting better. So, I mean, th that is a global question. Uh, I think what's important as an artist, it doesn't matter how I create my image. It's the image. Um, I'm not a journalist. Uh, I, I, you know, we, as you said, a lot of this has existed for ages. Uh, it's the same thing like, you know, Final Draft, when they made it easier for things to do. All the people that, had, up to that point, had learned every shortcut and, and think, were all angry at the, at the people that now could use it for the masses. But you know what? It doesn't change the fact that you're, tell, you're the only you. You're the only person that sees through your eyes that can tell a story through your thing. And photography is a language. So 
the first time you pick up a camera, I can say three words, and maybe I don't know how to say, where's the bathroom? But if I study, and I use different lenses, which are different accents, and tell different stories, and I learn, not only can I tell a story about an image, but I can craft it to what I need it to be. So I don't know where we get with AI, learning that and not learning that. I am worried about portraiture, I'm worried about that. I don't see a point where it's gonna replace street photography, replace event photography, replace journalism, because those are moments that happen in an in, in instant. I mean, it could fake it, but it's not the same. Yeah, follow up? Yeah. No, it all depends on the artist. So yes, absolutely we are. You have a person that I, I, can, I can sit here and have the computer create a symphony for me, but if I sit down with my bass guitar and a saxophone and, and play it myself, I'm the one that created that, not the computer. So it's, a, it, it, it's and now it's like, well, did you really do that to yourself? Or really? So yeah, I might have to take a photo live and show someone that I did it all on my own instead of you know, just putting it up there. You know, and, and that's where behind the scenes is great for you know, us that are creators. And not only, like, and this is a whole different conversation, is, is as a photographer, we shouldn't think of ourselves as photographers. We are a brand. I am, my, I am Travis. Um, and what I do is different than anyone else. So when I'm showing people not only my Instagram and social media, I want to record something. I carry a, a DJI Pocket 3 so I can record things as I'm doing them and have it follow me so I can put up behind the scenes. And we want people to connect emotionally with us as an artist and not just the photos. Any other questions? Well, I'm going to put up uh, the last screen. I guess just my contact information I should probably put up. But uh, you know, if I have time for that, I'll, I'll, we'll throw it up after, whatever. Um, uh, but uh, you can reach me at TravisWKeys.com. All my stuff is there. Or Instagram, T-W-K-E-Y-E-S. My, my uh, little link tree is there, and you can find all my links there. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank Deb from APA, who always is uh, really, really just, if you want someone that cares about this community and uh, is going to be there to help you reach out to her. She, she, she will send you our newsletter. Uh, APA is there to really give you the tools. I want to thank Seth, who has built this incredible space for us. And I want to thank all of you that have tuned in to listen to some guy that, uh, you know, <laughs> just fell in love with the photo and, and movies that uh, is standing here and, and trying to, uh, you know, do his thing. So I want to thank all of you for coming. And uh, that's what I got. <laughs>